All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jordan Bishop. I'm the executive director of the Wyoming Interfaith Network. I hope everybody's doing all right and is in good health. Today, I'm having a conversation with Rabbi Jack Moline, who is the president of the Interfaith Alliance. Uh, the Interfaith Alliance is a nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. that is dedicated to protecting the uh, integrity of both religion and democracy in the United States. So Jack, thank you so much for joining me today. I've been looking forward to this. Um, how have you and your family been doing? Thank you for asking. We've been doing just great. I have three adult children, each of whom is quarantined in their own residence. And my wife and I are uh, enjoying the time together. And because the house is large enough, we're enjoying the time apart too. That's good. That's good to hear. Yeah. It's nice. To, uh, I, I've been reflecting a lot on just how, how blessed and lucky I am to, to have a home to, to stay in, to stay safe in, and a lovely wife to, to stay here with. It's, it is so important for everybody to keep that in mind. However frustrated I get at my social isolation and not being able to hug my two grandchildren, I understand that I'm living a life of privilege in these very difficult times. Right. Well, before we really get started, I'd like you to kind of give a general introduction to uh, your work at the Interfaith Alliance and sure. what you and you, uh, your affiliates do. Well, Interfaith Alliance is uh, just past 25 years old. We've just concluded the celebration of our 25th anniversary. We were founded in 1996, very much in response to the rise of the religious right, the uh, political activism under the uh, direction of people like Jerry Falwell Sr. and uh, Pat Robertson, Franklin Graham. And uh, there was a, a lot of activism on their part attempting to insert what they identified as uh, Christian values into the American body politic. A group of activist uh, ministers, priests, rabbis, and imams came together to offer a different view of America, one in which religious faith and practice was protected by the Constitution, but government and religion were not allowed to interfere in each other's business. And so we are, uh, we have followed that mandate of protecting faith and freedom over these past 25 years. I actually joined the board of Interfaith Alliance uh, just after my bar mitzvah, uh, when uh, shortly after it, it formed, was with the board for quite a number of years and served as chair of the board for a couple of years. And then uh, I went on to do a couple other things and was sort of called back into service when my predecessor, uh, Reverend C. Welton Gaddy, retired after his tenure. And, uh, I came on temporarily and uh, I was like the house guest that never left. I've really been enjoying this work professionally over the past five years and have seen us become uh, even more relevant today than we thought we were 25 years ago. Right, right. So you say, um, I mean, the slogan of the Interfaith Alliance is protecting faith and freedom. Right. Uh, could you explain a little bit about what that means? Sure. The first two rights enumer enumerated in the uh, First Amendment, the very first rights vouchsafed to uh, the American people, uh, were the guarantee that Congress and, and the government in general would not interfere in the business of uh, religious communities. They would make no rules, no laws about establishing religion in this country. And it's important to to note that it uh, does not say establishing a religion, but establishing religion. The very first position in the Constitution is that the government is neutral uh, when it comes to the question of religion. Um, and that's the faith that we're protecting. Uh, there is no one who is a member of a favored tradition in this country, and there is no one who is expected to be a member of any tradition in this country um, because the government can't decree that. Which leads, of course, to the second right, which is the protection of conscience, that everyone has freedom to choose to be a part of a faith community, a religious community, or to choose not to be a part of a faith community. And that's the freedom that we're protecting. Our efforts are, are devoted to both. Now, one of the things that distinguishes us from a lot of the organizations in which we find ourselves 
allies and in coalition, is that many of them take a strictly constitutional perspective. They say that uh, government has to be neutral toward religion, and therefore the only thing that counts is the Constitution. Uh, those are groups like the ACLU or People for the American Way. Very good groups, and we're in allyship with them all the time. Then there are other groups that contend that what's most important to protect is freedom of religion, that they want to be uh, free to practice their religion however they see fit, free from any fetters of, of government uh, imposition. And uh, some of those are extremely right-wing groups. Others of them are more moderate, and we will find ourselves in, in alliance with them. But they take a faith-based approach or even a denominational approach. We're the only organization that I'm aware of who affirms that both of those clauses are essential and, in fact, dependent on each other. And so uh, when we say we're protecting faith and freedom, I like to emphasize the and more than I do mm -hmm. the faith and the freedom. Right. I, I should say that the, uh, the Wyoming Interfaith Network voted, uh, our board of directors voted in January to become an affiliate of the Interfaith Alliance. And so we are, um, we are definitely with you on all of these issues. Um, and we're delighted to have you. You're our newest yeah. affiliate and uh, we're very proud. You're the, you're the vanguard of our new growth. Yep, out here in the Wild West. Um, well, I, uh, I, I have a question related to why, why should people, I'll just put it bluntly, why should people care about religious freedom? I mean, you hear religious freedom talked about mainly by certain groups, um, at least very publicly, who gets the domination in like the media narrative is right-wing groups that are saying we need religious freedom and especially in the past really since 2014 there's been um, a lot of talk about religious freedom and as it relates to um, Obamacare and, and several other issues. So why is this something that somebody who is maybe not religious or just the average person um, living in Wyoming, why should they care about issues related to religious freedom? You know, it's, it's a very important question to consider, particularly if, if someone who's watching or listening to me is someone who's very comfortable in their circumstances. They don't have to be concerned about these things. I know that the, the notion of independence is taken very seriously in, in Wyoming, much more so than, uh, than here on the East Coast sometimes. Um, and people just don't want to be told what freedom means they know it in their bones. And, and so it's really important to answer a question like this because as Americans, we are not only about individual liberty. We may have radical autonomy as a matter of philosophy, but we are an, in practice a nation of laws and a nation of mutual dependence and responsibility. The motto of the United States originally and, and still the co-motto of the United States is e pluribus unum out of the many, one, which means that every citizen has a responsibility to bring everything he or she is to the body politic, mm -hmm. and at the same time, be prepared to defend the rights, the responsibilities, and the privileges of every other citizen to be an equal part of that unum, of that unity. So somebody who is, is living a good life uh, and who is enjoying all the blessings and benefits of being an American citizen, uh, ought to take great pride in it and ought to protect that with alacrity. Anything that would come to interfere with it should be resisted. By the same token, because you and I have a responsibility for each other, even though we live at opposite ends of the continent, at the same time, I have to be concerned that if your freedom is abridged, that my freedom could be next. And therefore, every citizen of this country has a responsibility to make sure that the promise of life, liberty, and uh, the pursuit of happiness is, is guaranteed to every resident, every citizen of this country. We've been through these discussions before on matters that are related to religion, but are not exactly religion. We've been through these discussions on matters of race. For a long time in this country, I don't have to tell you, people of color were second-class citizens, if they were citizens at all. And we're still in the process of making sure that the rights and promises that, that every American can depend on 
are equally available to every citizen in the country. Well, it's the same thing with religion. My religious observance, I'm a Jew, which may be obvious from the fact that my title is rabbi. My religious observance is very important to me, is critical to me. It helps to define my life. But it's not a religious observance that I can enforce for anybody else, even another fellow Jew who's an American citizen. If I observe the Sabbath, which I do, and I don't work on that day, and I don't write on that day, and I don't conduct business on that day, I don't have the right to say to people who, who want to pursue their daily activities on a Friday night or a Saturday that they can't do that because it goes against my faith. And I think what's a little difficult for, for people who have lived in a Christian majority in this country to, to accept is that though it is normative to be Christian in America, more Americans are Christian than any other faith tradition, more Amer Americans identify as Christian than any other faith tradition, just because it is in many ways normative doesn't mean that society or, sit or the citizenry has an obligation to that normative practice. And that's why people of conscience need to be careful to protect even people they don't know uh, for the rights and privileges that, that obtain to them under the Constitution. Right. Uh, what do you mean by, could you explain a little bit by what you mean as people of conscience? That's a kind of a, a phrase that's used a lot during sure. talking about religious freedom. Sure. You know, the name of our, the name of our organization is Interfaith Alliance. And uh, I've come to understand, I came to understand very quickly when I took this position, that uh, the most loaded part of that name is faith. We have a lot of folks in this country who are very clear on what their religious convictions are and what the name of the, of the tradition and the name of the God in which they believe are. But there is an increasing number of people in this country who profess no particular faith or who define themselves as spiritual but not religious in the sense that they don't affiliate or who even claim to be secular or non-believers at all, or some who adhere to a tradition that really can't be called a faith tradition. Uh, it's more of, a, more of a philosophy, like Buddhism. So when I say freedom of conscience, what I'm really talking about is what I think the founders meant when they guaranteed uh, religious freedom in the Constitution. Um, it's, it's not clear that any of our founders were traditional believers the way we define traditional believers today. It is clear that they, hold, they held a variety of views on the efficacy of organized religion and on the, uh, the, the catechism or the dogma or the practices of any one faith tradition. And in fact, as author Stephen Waldman likes to say, the religion of our founders was really religious freedom. And as I, as I mentioned a, a few minutes ago, Religious freedom also means the freedom not to believe. Mm. So I believe that what the founders meant when they said religious freedom was religious conscience. And I know that the phrase religious freedom, and I know that the phrase conscience uh, has been, have been uh, hijacked by the religious right and redefined in a way that weaponizes it against people who disagree with them. I refuse to let that happen. Those words have, have important and, and inclusive meaning, and they can't be defined out of our vocabulary. Yeah, thanks for saying more about that. I've been doing a lot of thinking about that recently, especially about the word interfaith. We're the Wyoming Interfaith Network. A lot of people, a lot of my friends who are not religious or do, do not consider themselves people of faith often ask me, well, can I join in with your work and your organization or will I not be allowed? And so I just tell them, well, we're for, we're for all people of Wyoming. We include people of faith and people of compassion. So if you fit in one of those two categories, then you can join us. Well, there you go. And we, we, have, we have had and we have uh, people who do not profess a belief in God or an attachment to a particular religious tradition on our board. So, so that is entirely consistent with who we are and what we do. Right. Um, so switching gears a little bit, um, I wanted to ask you just, I, I can't ignore the current crisis that we're all um, in the midst of right now. Um, 
And I know there's a lot of issues related to religious freedom that have come up in particular during this time. Um, so, so first, I'll ask you, what role do you think faith, community, faith communities should be playing during this COVID-19 pandemic? Well, I think uh, the second greatest casualty of this pandemic, next to the uh, lives and health of those people who were infected with the virus, the second greatest uh, infection is, is loneliness and despair. Faith communities have, I think, an obligation to reach out not only to their own members, but to members of their community who are, for lack of a better term, unchurched, to make sure that no one is neglected in this time when we can't have even incidental contact with people uh, as we go about our business. So a person who lives alone and, and really just exchanges a, a few pleasantries with, with the checker at the grocery counter or with the pharmacist when they go to pick up a prescription or with the, uh, with the salesperson when they go shopping for, for some new clothes, doesn't even have that opportunity for human interaction anymore. And if we really believe that we should love our neighbors as ourselves, which is what every faith tradition teaches, then we have to, at this time in particular, take that literally and make sure that the person who lives next to us or behind us, or in the case of Wyoming, an hour away, if that's the next, uh, the next residence, uh, have to make sure that they're not left alone. That's the number one responsibility of people who believe in, in, in the religious mission which is to bring people closer to one another and closer to the source of their beliefs. The second thing is to keep them safe. And faith communities have, I believe, an, an undeniable responsibility not to bring people together to gather in, in worship or in activity during this time of quarantine. It is not the case that people must be phys physically proximate in order to generate a spiritual experience or to fulfill religious obligation. And I come from a tradition where in order to have a prayer quorum, you have to have 10 adults present. And, and we've simply set that aside because it's dangerous to people's health. More important than, than prayers being offered in a particular format is that life be preserved. And it's sort of stunning to me that some of the people that we are, we frequently find ourselves in conflict with, people who proclaim themselves to be pro-life, and I proclaim myself to be pro-life as well, um, that, that seems to only apply to reproductive choice, to reproductive health. Being pro-life means being willing to preserve life from the point that you define it as beginning to the point where you define it as ending. And being pro-life right now means being at least six feet away from your nearest human being. Right. Yeah, that's, that's a good point to bring up. I, I've, uh, I was talking to a pastor friend the other day about the, the hijacking of that term as well. Um, you know, we've, the Wyoming Interfaith Network has been doing some work on the repeal of the death penalty in the state of Wyoming. I know that's, um, it's been an uphill battle, but what, what's been awesome through that is uh, having a really broad coalition of individuals, nonprofit organizations, businesses, and people around the state um, that have come together that normally would not come together under any other circumstances, but we found common ground in this particular issue and were able to tackle it, which really I think is the beauty of interfaith work is, is coming together across these lines of difference that sometimes can see, seem so insurmountable, but uh, it, it's, it's incredible that when we can do that. It's an important campaign that you're involved in. And without presuming the opinion of anybody who's watching the two of us have this conversation, it is something that enables people to discuss the essential issues of life and morality and death, even in disagreement. And so it, it, is, it is important that a question like this, criminal justice in general, but the death penalty in particular, be discussed even when there appears to be, as, as there may very well be in certain sections of, of the state, uh, a consensus on what the answer ought to be. 
it should not be unexamined because we are talking about human life. Right, right, absolutely. Um, well, switching gears, we have just a few more minutes left here. Sure. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about, about religious freedom in general, and then in the context of COVID-19, uh, how can we tell people that are watching to, how, how can people stay informed, stay vigilant about issues related to religious freedom during this time? Well, thank you for setting me up for the answer to that question. Um, Interfaith Alliance's national office has been presenting a, a program every afternoon at uh, 12 15 eastern time which is i guess 10 15, uh, 15 mountain time yeah. so it's it's the morning there uh on our facebook page uh, interfaith alliance uh, uh it's facebook live we record it as you and i are doing right now on zoom and it's up on facebook and then after we finish recording it's still up on facebook and also on our youtube uh playlist uh, the name of the show is Stay Home, Stay Focused, and that's also the uh, address for it on YouTube, stayhomestayfocused.org or .com. Either one will work. And I've had the privilege now 22 times to talk to people who are, um, who are prominent in, in their field of endeavor, mostly related to advocating for causes that we consider to be critical some of whom I agree with, some of whom I disagree with, and a number of people in uh, public life and a number of people who are uh, doing things that I know people are thinking about today. So I'll give you uh, a couple of examples. Rachel Lazar, who is the president and uh, chief executive officer of Americans United for the Separation of Church and State, was one of my guests there among our strongest allies. I had an opportunity to talk for 20 minutes with Senator Maisie Hirono from Hawaii about her perspectives on, on the COVID virus. Uh, and I spoke with uh, Mindy Botball, who is, as it happens, my sister, but is a funeral director in Chicago about the pressures uh, that she's feeling and the challenges that she has as someone who has to shepherd people through the unfortunate ultimate result of some of these infections. And so we've, we've talked about all these things from the perspective of true religious freedom, of protecting faith and protecting freedom. 20 minutes in the middle of the day, it'll give you something to think about, something to act on if it, if it appeals to your values. And uh, it's a nice conversation, maybe not as well conducted as the one you are right now, but, uh, but a, good, uh, a good opportunity to break up the day and learn something. And you can listen to our podcast, State of Belief, mm -hmm. which is at stateofbelief.com, which has been on for 15 years now. Uh, my friend and predecessor, Welton Gaddy, is the host. And uh, he has two or three newsmakers each week talking about the intersection of religion, politics, and government. Awesome. Yeah, I've been, I've been trying to catch those as, as often as I can and, and live during the day. And it's been fun to learn a lot and see new faces and hear about issues that I didn't know about before. Um, and it certainly has, has sparked something within me to kind of do something similar on a Wyoming level. So thank That's you for idea. that. That's a great idea. Yeah. And it's really important for people to support the Wyoming Interfaith, Interfaith Network. It is just, as a, it's not a new organization, but as a new affiliate of Interfaith Alliance, you have the ability to be a conduit for common cause with people across this country in the issues that may not face people in Wyoming immediately, but ought to be of immediate concern to anybody who considers himself or herself citizen of the United States. All right, well said. Well, I have one final question for you, sure. um, if, you're, if you're willing to answer it. So I, I I'm interested in, I've, I've asked many of our uh, board members and other people in our organization to share something from their uh, religious tradition that has given them hope or strength during this time? Sure. So as, as the head of an interfaith organization, I've, I've learned that I, I have to be attentive to the fact that not everything I consider to be essentially Jewish is exclusively Jewish. Right. So the, the quick example of that is 
I've always taught the maxim, whoever saves a single life saves an entire world, as coming from Jewish tradition. Uh, it wasn't so long ago I discovered that it's also in the Quran and that uh, it, it was written at the same time and therefore the connection between Judaism and Islam is even stronger than I might have thought. Mm. But here's a story that I've heard in lots of traditions. I've been using it a lot lately because it really speaks to the issue of the day. Um, the story is this. Uh, a king captures uh, his enemy who is reputed to be a very wise man. And he brings this, the captive before him and he says, I'm a reasonable man. In my cupped hands, I hold a small bird. And if you and your wisdom can tell me whether that bird is alive or dead, if you're correct, I'll grant you your life. Well, the opponent isn't called wise for nothing, and he knows that if he says the bird is alive, the king will simply crush the bird in his cupped hands and prove him wrong. And if he says the bird is dead, the king will open his hands and the bird will fly away and he'll be wrong again. So he looks at the king and he says, your majesty, the matter is in your hands. And that's who all of us are right now. We're both the king and the wise man. The matter is in our hands and we have the opportunity to be wise and compassionate, or we have the opportunity to be divisive and to crush out the life that, that we hold so precious. Very nice. Thanks. Well, Rabbi Jack Moline, thanks so much. We're just about out of time here. But before we sign off, I want to encourage people to check out Interfaith Alliance at interfaithalliance.org and also can find them on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, also, Wyoming Interfaith can be found at yointerfaith.org, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all the other channels. Uh, well, thanks so much for talking to me today. It's I, my pleasure. Good luck with this series, Jordan, and, and much success with WIN. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you.